or adrenaline of some other sort has put you into a full waking state. Are you prepared? Good morning. So nice to have you here. Aren't you glad we pay our electric bill? Please make note of the announcements that are in the bulletin. There are those that they are there for children and for adults. Chuck will later mention in his sermon that he's taking a group on a fishing retreat to Texoma. He knows that lake so well, he doesn't really need a guide. When he's by himself, he fills up the boat. So if you guys go with him, be prepared to sink. But if you want some fish in your freezer, uh, you might want to consider venturing north to Lake Texoma with Chuck. In some churches in New England, people pay money to have their names put on the pews in brass, and you have to get permission to sit there. Our church isn't quite like that. Ours has more to do with tradition, where people say, you're in my seat, would you please get out? During the month of August, we are going to be redoing the floors and the carpets in the balcony. So those of you that have found a very comfortable place, you're going to want to look around the downstairs part of the sanctuary and see if you could also find a very comfortable place. We're putting hardwood in instead of the tile. Uh, some of the carpet will be removed, others will be replaced. That will happen three weeks in August. I think certain sections of the balcony will still be open, so you may have to move, but you might not have to descend to the lower depths of the sanctuary. As we stand to greet one another this morning, uh, we would ask that you do so and then remain standing for the call to worship. Give everybody a friendly hello. invited to participate in the morning worship service of First United Methodist Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. God's frozen chosen. Methodists are known as Mary. We are Mary Methodists, so we hope that you all feel welcome. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts.
Let us pray. Lord, make us instruments of your peace in our church community and in our world. Help us to comfort one another, understand one another, and forgive one another, that we may be your people of blessing to all. Amen. You may be seated. never really said a whole lot and the three of us loved to play Star Wars and so what we would do what that meant is we'd all put our action figures together we'd go over to somebody's house and we'd act out all the scenes from the Star Wars movies and I didn't have a lot of action figures I just had two I had R2-D2 and I had a uh, uh, Luke Skywalker that had the lightsaber though that you push the little thing in the plastic lightsaber would come out of his hand and JC had a whole bunch of Star Wars figures, and Sid, who didn't say much, had a whole lot of Star Wars figures. And he had one that he never took out of the box. It stayed in its original packaging. And JC and I used to make fun of Sid about that and go, that's ridiculous, you can't play with that. And 
And he said, no, it's going to be worth something someday. And i got to tell you, this was no ordinary Star Wars action figure in the original packaging. It was Boba Fett. Ooh. And he would never take it out. And we used to always laugh. So we would play with all the Star Wars action figures, and we would do all the battles and all the flights and all that. Well, towards the end of the summer, we kept teasing him about it. And he said, trust me, it's going to be worth something someday. So, one day, we heard some bad news, Sid and I. Say, what was the bad news? What was the bad news? Say it like you mean it. What was the bad news? What was the bad news? The bad news was that JC told us that he had to move away, that his dad had gotten a job in New Mexico, and he was going to have to move away. And we were sad about that, Sid and I were, for a couple of reasons. Number one, JC was a really good friend of ours, and number two, he had the only Yoda. And so we didn't know what we were going to do. So we all got together, Sid and I, and we were starting to play. And it was the day that JC was going to leave, and we knew he was going to go. And so we were sad about that. And we were also sad because we had found a little Oscar the Grouch green finger puppet, and we had stuck some construction paper green ears to make it look like Yoda. But we all knew it wasn't Yoda. And it was Oscar the Grouch. And we got real sad about that. And we didn't know what to do. And then JC came by to tell us goodbye. He had come down on his bicycle and to tell us goodbye. And, and we didn't really know what to do. We were kind of sad, but do we cry? Or are we supposed to cry right now? Or are we supposed to tell jokes and pretend like we're not sad right now? And so Sid went in the other room and he came back out with the Boba Fett in the original packaging. And he tore open that package and he handed Boba Fett to JC. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, are you crazy? That you've been saving that. You said it was going to be worth something someday. And you said, and now that, if you sold that, you could buy like two Chewbacca's and a Stormtrooper and a Yoda and maybe an X-Wing fighter and all kinds of cool stuff. And, and Sid just smiled and handed it to JC and said, I want JC to have it. And he told JC, he said, JC, when you're in New Mexico and you play with this, you can think about us and remember our friendship. And JC smiled, and then he pedaled off. And, and Sid was kind of watching JC, and I looked at Sid again, because I still didn't understand. I said, Sid, you said that was going to be worth something someday. And Sid, who didn't say very much, said, well, this was that day, and it was totally worth it. Now, what I have for each one of you is something it's special. Now, I've got to warn you in advance, it's not Boba Fett in the original packaging. So it's not going to pay for your college tuition or anything like that. But you can open it now. You can open it later. You can put it in your sock drawer and open it years from now. You can give it to a friend to open. It's totally up to you. But it's something that will be worth something someday. Maybe only to you. Maybe only today. But that's totally up to you. Okay? And our teachers are going to help pass that out after our prayer. Let's have a prayer together. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for friendships. Thank you for everything. Thank you for things that are really worth something. Help us remember that they're worth even more when we share them with others. Amen. All right, make sure you get one of these before you leave. Thank you. All right. Well, we're pleased to share with you a special ministry moment at this time, and we're pleased to have Heidi Swartz with us, Executive Director of the Cowtown Marathon, and Brian Hawker, the Board President, with us to share again this special presentation, and Sammy Dunn, our own church member here, 
wearing proudly her new blue shirt hospitality polo shirt as a coordinator of our blue shirt hospitality team, wonderful leader, doing a great job. And Jay Clement, longtime member and, and leader with our media ministry as well. And I'm going to turn it over to Brian at this point to share our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chuck, and good morning. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, but I guess I, uh, I want to kind of set the record straight at the beginning. Um, Bill, I am one of God's frozen chosen. <laughs> so um, Teresa and I have um, happily been members of First Presbyterian Church just a few blocks from here over on Penn Street. Yay! For, <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Bill, for about 25 years now. Um, and I will tell you, the only thing I, that, that predates us as far as those 25 years is I ran my first Cowtown, I believe the year before we joined First Presbyterian Church, back in about 19, um, 1987. So I've been involved with the Cowtown all these years, began to volunteer about six years ago, and am currently serving as chair of the board for a, for a two-year term. Um, before we recognize your, your fellow congregants today, we thought we'd tell you a little bit about the history of Cowtown real quickly and what we're all about and who we benefit. Um, the Cowtown actually began back in 1979 with a little less than 400 people gathering together. They liked to run and they decided they'd set up a course downtown and, and run a marathon. Fast forward to this year, 2011, we had slightly over 22,000 registrants in six events that ran, from the, um, that ran from the Coliseum, the Will Rogers Coliseum. The event has now expanded to three days. On Friday, we have a health and fitness expo that runs actually both Friday and Saturday. Think of it as a health festival, if you will, with all sorts of health screening, paraphernalia. You can buy sneakers there, get, get um, health tips and fitness tips. On Saturday, we run three races. We run the children's 5K, which a 5K is a 3.1 mile race, uh, an adult 5K, which is what many of you participated in this year, and an adult 10K, which is a 6.1 mile road race. Then on Sunday morning, we run our marathon events, which include the classic marathon 26.2 miles, a half marathon, and then what some people call the crazy marathon, there's an ultra. Uh, an ultra is a 50K road race, or 30.1 uh, 30 miles. Um, so any one of those events are open to all of you. Um, many people ask, what does the Cowtown benefit? And I like to start to explain that by saying we're somewhat unique. And back in the day, um, in the, the 70s through the 80s, and actually up until just a few years ago, it's pretty costly to put on these events, and we actually operated at a deficit. And there were six companies in town, very generous companies, who made up that deficit at the end of the year. Just a few years ago, you know, this growth that we've, explosion we've had has really been in the last five years to get to 22,000 runners. We now do have a surplus. And we ask ourselves, you know, what do we do well as a Caltown, and how could we give back to the community? One thing that we do is bring a lot of people together in the interest of health and fitness. The other thing that's unique about us is that children's 5K, the kids 5K that I told you about, as far as we know, it's one of the largest in the country with about 5,000 children runners. We talk to folks in the community, and a real problem today is overweight children in elementary um, and junior high moving on into high school. Childhood obesity is reaching, some say, epidemic, epidemic proportions both in Texas and nationwide. So we thought that was something worth addressing. And Heidi, our executive director, is going to tell you what we've been doing in that area. Heidi? Our children's program been, has been taking place since the mid-80s. 1986, we've had the Adopt-a-School program participated with us, and they helped us get children's teams participating in our race. We gave the kids a really discounted fee, so they didn't pay very much. And we had some companies that would actually go to the schools and help pay for those kids. But as the years went by, the Adopt-a-School program phased that out a bit, and these kids were paying for it themselves. About five years ago, 
um, every year when the schools come, the coaches come one certain week of the year and they bring their entire team registration with them, all of the entry forms. And we have teams ranging from 10 kids to 500 kids from one school. And so it's quite a feat. We get all these entries coming in and the coaches come in with these cardboard boxes full of entries. And about five years ago, I had a coach come in. We had a line out the door with coaches wanting to turn in our teams. And she was from North High, North High Mount Elementary. She had a team of about 40 kids. She had 25 kids with entry fees and their entry fee of $14 each. And then she had these other 15 children she had no money for. They've been training, they start training in the fall and we go to the schools and work with them. But she said she didn't know what she was going to do and would I take her income tax return to pay for those children? So I said, no, I won't take your income tax return. And that's how our children's program evolved and it turned into CAF, Children's Activities for Life and Fitness. We now raise money, we give out grants to all those underprivileged kids so that there's no child that is turned away, they can all run if they wanna run. And in the last three years, we've started also discovering that these kids that didn't have the money to pay their entry fee, they don't have the shoes to run in either. So now we're giving all of these children New Balance running shoes. Um, and it's just grown and grown. This year we did three times as many shoes as the previous year. We gave out 600 pairs of New Balance running shoes and 600 grants to children that needed to uh, have help in funding so that they could participate and learn that running is something that you can do and you can take for your entire life and continue it and stay healthy and fit and it doesn't cost much it's a pair of shoes on friday of this past week i found it was really fitting that we were coming here today because i got an email from a uh, elementary school coach she finally things had calmed down it's summer and so she sat down and she wrote us an email over at the cowtown and I wanted to read it to you because it's not just us that's giving them these shoes and these entry fees, it's everybody that participates in our race. By participating in our race, helping with the water stations, running and paying your entry fee, you're helping for us to be able to have the funds and the availability to give these youth what they need, their entry fees and their shoes and the training that we go to the schools and help them with so that they can learn to be healthy. So I'd just like to read this really quick email to you from her. I just wanted to take a few moments and let you know how much you are appreciated. I have been, been meaning to email you for several months and now, finally, our Cowtown shoe recipients were so excited when their new shoes arrived. You should have seen the smiles on our kids' faces. This grant program is the best thing ever to help promote the sport of running and the benefits as a lifetime fitness activity. What a great thing you guys are doing for our Fort Worth ISD kids. Keep up the good work. Please let me know if I or my students can be of assistance to you in the future. And so what a great thing you all are doing to help us to be able to make this possible for these children. So thank you very much. Thank you, Heidi. Jay. Okay. So, um, appreciate you all being here, but uh, let me tell you, we love these two people at Cowtown. I'm sure, I'm sure many of you know them. Sammy Dunn was responsible for putting together the volunteers, upwards of 25 individuals for a water stop on our new 10K course over on Bailey Avenue. So we hand out um, water and refreshments to the participants in the race. Sammy, thank you very much for that. Jay Clement organized an adult 5K team, which I'm sure some of you were a part of. Jay, we appreciate your help with that. May I ask, if you were one of those volunteers this past year in, uh, in February, last weekend of February, would you stand up, water stop volunteer? Here we go. All right, how about? <laughs> Remain standing for me. Remain standing. How about if you ran in the 5K race? Could you rise as well? <laughs> That's not funny. People actually do that. <laughs> We're not making this up. If you've ever, per thank you. There's a gentleman in the back. Yes, all right. I, I knew you were supposed to be back here. Great. And if you've ever participated in Caltown as a volunteer or a runner, would you please stand and let's give these folks a hand. We have a nice plaque for your trophy case. We also have... Training shirt? We'll show you we have some training shirts for this year. This is so they can start running. 
training church to get ready for our race in 2012. Always the last weekend in February. So that's what you want to reserve on your calendar. Lots of ways to get involved in our event besides just running and walking. Um, you know, it takes time to distribute all these t-shirts to folks. We hand out water. We have the health and fitness expo. We have greeters for that. There's something for everyone to do. Even if you don't want to get out of your chair, there are folks two months before the event pull medals from uh, cartons and, and unfurl them and lay them out so that we can distribute them quickly at race day. You know, I will tell you personally, um, it, having just kind of been on the circuit for a number of years, one of the most memorable things for me running a marathon was the New York City Marathon, this is back quite a few years ago, coming off the Verrazano Bridge into the streets of Brooklyn in, in church choirs. Do we have a choir here? <laughs> there we go. They're hard to see from here. Church choirs standing at the curb singing hymns. Um, closer to home, up the road in Oklahoma City, a downtown Methodist church close to the start and finish line actually does a free pancake breakfast for participants um, each year. Um, thank you so much. I, I kind of read ahead in your bulletin and I see you ask yourself, where will you go and what will you do at the end of each service? I think that's beautiful. And um, I, I know this church well enough that I think you answer that with your hearts and your hands regularly. And we're just privileged at Cowtown that, that you keep us in mind. Thank you so much. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you. And you are my witnesses, says the Lord. together affirm our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As your children, O oh God, we are told that you are within us, that you are a part of our DNA. In the scriptures, we hear that Christ resides like a treasure within us. Gracious God, do you see you in us? You know our hearts, and you see how we treat one another. Do our brothers and sisters see you in us? We beg you, merciful God, place upon our hearts not only a desire to serve you, but ignite within us a deep passion to be servants, servants willing to go last and willing to take the least. Remind us, O oh God, of the importance to you that our life honor you Remind us that when we give of ourselves, whether we give one hour or five minutes, your light within us shines. When we are at work or at play, the way that we treat our friends, our coworkers, when we treat each other fairly and with respect, your light within us shines. And when we reach out to help someone, someone we don't even know, but we do so because we know they too are a child of yours, your light within us shines brightly. And now, as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, help us to see you in ourselves and in one another. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Today's New Testament reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 through 10. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of the darkness. Who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ? But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. God speaks to us through the reading of the scriptures. I firmly believe that a better understanding about uh, our hymnody leads to better singing. We can sing from a more um, educated base when we know the history behind some of our uh, extremely rich hymns. And this morning's hymn uh, falls into that category of rich hymnody. Um, like lots of hymns, it comes to us from a very different place. Not a place of uh, strength, uh, but a place of trial and tribulation. Um, Horatio Spafford, the writer of It Is Well, uh, was a great um, financial wizard in Chicago uh, in the 1870s. Just before uh, the fire that consumed uh, so much of the real estate there, he actually had just lost his uh, only son. He had three daughters and one son. Uh, and he was devastated, obviously. And just after that, uh, was trying to get, get that off of his mind, decided that he was going to make a big business uh, investment and invested almost his entire net worth into real estate. And in doing so, he then lost his entire net worth um, when those buildings burned to the ground in uh, 1871. So having lost his son, having lost uh, so much of, of who he was in the real estate world, uh, he decided to take a trip over to Europe with his family, with his wife and his three girls. Um, there was some business venture that uh, actually had timed itself just right, and um, he was supposed to finish it and then catch up with them uh, along the way over in England. So he sent them on a boat and stayed home in Chicago himself. Uh, he was about to make his way to New York and then ultimately over to Europe when he got a, a call uh, that the boat that his wife and three girls was on sank. It hit uh, an English ship and went down in 12 seconds. There were very few survivors that day. Uh, but his wife uh, eventually came to shore in Wales and sent back a note, saved alone. Those were the only words she wrote back to him. So he made his way to New York and then made his way over to Europe. And uh, on the trip over the mid-Atlantic where, um, where his uh, family was lost, uh, the captain notified him that they were in sort of the general vicinity and he was able, with incredible clarity, to write down these words, It is well with my soul. Uh, the, ver the first verse shows the pain and suffering that he went through when, so when sorrows like sea billows roll. But by the third verse, he says, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. And then he looks eventually to the coming of Christ. Uh, it is with that clarity uh, that we sing this morning, with that great knowledge of where this hymn came from and what we are going to in turn do with it. So I invite you to stand as we sing hymn 377, It Is Well With My Soul.
Dr. Brewster has the opportunity to preach this Sunday in a church in Michigan and open up the pulpit for me to share the message today, so I thank you very much. Reverend Chuck Graff, associate pastor here, and uh, again, I'm grateful to share the good news with you today. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts this morning as we gather to worship you in spirit and in truth be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I wanted to ask you, where were you last Sunday afternoon? Did any of you get to see the FIFA World Championship women's soccer match? Anybody here get to see that? I tell you, that was one outstanding soccer game. I think it was one of the best athletic events I've seen in, in quite some time. The sportsmanship, the athleticism, everything that happened in that match just had everything you'd want in an athletic competition. It was between uh, Japan and the United States. It was held in Frankfurt, Germany. And uh, both teams had risen to the point where they were vying for this world championship opportunity. The game went back and forth. The U.S. scored and Japan scored and the U.S. scored again and then Japan. And finally it went to overtime and it ended up being tied in overtime. And then after the overtime, they had a kickoff, a shoot off after that. And Japan won by just one goal at the end of the match. But really, it was, a, in a sense, a victory for both teams because it was one of the most outstanding, I think, sportsmanship and athletic competitions we've seen in quite some time. They were both vying for this wonderful title of world champions, and also they were going to receive this trophy, the gold-plated trophy they'd be able to keep, keep as one of the treasures that they'd sought for in all the competition that led up to that final game between the teams. During one of the commercials of that match, they had this really uh, remarkable commercial, you may have seen it, it's about a small dog, I believe it's a terrier, who's sitting in the kitchen, family kitchen in front of his dish, his dinner bowl, and in there he has a big juicy white bone that he's just staring at. But he doesn't know quite what to do with this treasure that he has. He uh, doesn't know whether to keep it there or how to protect it, to keep it safe. So he goes out in the backyard and digs a hole and he buries the treasure there. And he doesn't think it's safe there, so he goes out and digs it back up and he carries it in his mouth. He hops on a bus and goes downtown to a local bank and he puts it in a safety deposit box, thinking it's gonna be safe there. This great treasure, greatest of all treasures he could have. And he can't sleep at night, he tosses and he turns and thinking about this bone, how he's gonna protect it and keep it safe. And finally he goes and picks it up and brings it back home and puts it back right in front of him, in front of the dish so he can keep track of it and keep this treasure take care of it. You know, we all have treasures in life. What are, the same things, what are some of the things that you treasure in your own life? I'm sure if you think about the priorities of what those would be, they'd be your family and your friends, some of your colleagues, some of your folks here at church that you really love and care about. But we all have special treasures as well, physical treasures that we value, in our homes especially. Uh, my wife Peggy and I were going through the Midwest uh, this spring to a, a wedding of one of my family members. And as we were going through, we were reflecting upon all the disasters that had struck in our own country and, and worldwide just in the last few months. And all the people who've lost many treasures that they value in their lives, not just their homes, but keepsakes and other things. You know, there have been the floods in Missouri and, and cities and, and houses swamped with water through the flooding. There's been the wildfires in Texas and New Mexico, Arizona, other places. There's been the tornadoes that hit Joplin and devastated that entire community as well. And the question always comes up from reporters and others, you know, if you're, you're in a disaster like that, what are the first things you take with you? And the, most of the major responses are, well, my family members, I check with them first, and my pets, some guys say, and maybe women in my golf clubs is maybe a second choice for some people. But, uh, but as you get up there thinking about what are some of the things you grab, what are some of the treasure you value that are keepsakes to you? Most of them that you think about would have a story behind them, I'm sure. Some kind of a family or relational connection of some time. I uh, shared with the staff recently that I have this communion set that, that I've had for a number of years. It's a very special communion set for me. It's one of the treasures I'd, I'd like to keep and pass on to my family members someday. It belonged to my grandfather who was still preaching. His name was Albright, a good Methodist name. He was still preaching when he was 80 years old and was going to start uh, serving part-time, but didn't make it to part-time, uh, uh, still serving a church, but he'd been serving for over 60 years in churches. And he had this communion set that my mother, who was a church organist and a, a good United Methodist over the years, had been passed down to her. And when I went to the ministry, she said, I want you to have this. It's one of the treasures 
that my grandfather, that, that her father, my grandfather gave to her. And it's this old worn communion set with an old, you know, stained bottle with old fermented grape juice in it from over the years. Um, and uh, a little bread container here. And she passed that on down to me and said, I want you to use it in the future. You know, it's one of the treasures of my life. I, I'd hate to use it, just knowing the numbers of shut-ins and the hospital visits and the many people he visited and served communion to and, and ministered to as a servant leader. I have many other things I, I have as well that I treasure that I, I'd hate to lose. And most people say if they were in a fire or disaster, they'd grab their photos or their photo albums or something. I have this photo of my grandfather. I never met him. He was a, an avid, he was a dentist in my local community where I grew up. But he was an avid outdoorsman. He, he loved to be outdoors. He, he was active in the church, but he believed also you got to get out there and experience God in creation and, and be, enjoy God in the beauty of the creation around us. And so he was a great outdoorsman, sportsman as well. And he used to go to Canada a lot and, and take my father up there in an old Model T Ford. And they would drive up and change tires three or four times on the way to get there and back. And they would fish together and just spend time out on the lake and these bonding experiences. My father started taking me out when I was 10 years old and it got in my blood as well. And so these pictures of my father and my grandfather and, and those who've been part of, of my life and my, sto my own personal story, it's not just the physical presence of these things, but it's the connection we have with these physical objects that often mean so much to us. The relationship, even though I don't know him, I never knew him, I still feel like I have a connection with him as well. I have one more item today. Mr. Mark doesn't get it to have all the props around here and all the, all the items, but it's a family Bible uh, that going back to 1872 that my great-grandfather had in our family. And they used to actually use this and read out of it, had all the commentary in it. What version do you think it's in? Anyone want to guess? King James Version. And uh, aren't you glad uh, that we have iPhones now and iPads to, to, uh, to that, carry our Bibles around now because it's a little hefty to carry with us. Well, you know, you think about all these treasures we have and how important they are to us. But in our scripture today, the Apostle Paul says there's one great treasure that discovered him when he was on the road to Damascus. And that was the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that was a new faith that he found when light came out of the darkness of his life and the path he was going of persecuting Christians and others, this light came out of the darkness in his life and this good news of Jesus Christ came to him and transformed and changed his life. And he's say, saying to the church of Corinth that I am a vessel, I am a human vessel. I am like a clay jar, but I contain this treasure now that God has given me. It's the grace of God, it's the love of God. It's that good news of Jesus Christ in my life that it's a foundation of my heart and my life now, out of which I'm going to live my life. And he was saying to the church of Corinth, I have this treasure that's greater than all the treasures of life that we could keep or lose in life. I have this treasure in my life of my faith. And it's the greatest treasure I could ever have because it's there when I need it to sustain me, to support me, to give me hope, to know that we're loved and we're accepted by God and God's grace. It's there to empower us to the calling what God has for us to do. But he was saying we're only vessels that carry this treasure. We're vessels that carry this treasure that's been passed on to us from Christ and the disciples to the early church throughout the generations to us here today and now. We have this treasure in the church today. It's called the good news of Jesus Christ in our lives. It's in each of you as a vessel of Jesus Christ. The good news of Christ is in you through the faith that you have in him, in your hearts, in your lives, in your very center of your being. It's in the church because the church is a beautiful building and we appreciate all the way it's kept up so well, but it's a container. It contains, Paul said, the good news of this treasure, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says it's like a clay jar, like an earthen vessel, like we are, human beings carrying the good news of Christ. And this church carries it as well. My mother-in-law is 92 years old now, and I could tell you some good stories because she lived with us for 12 years, but I won't go into that at this point in time. But we, she has some good stories together that we share because she lived in part of our home for those years. She's 92 years old this weekend. She's had a very uh, difficult physical bout with uh, congestive heart failure and uh, uh, kidney malfunctioning, some other things. And we've had to hospitalize her this weekend. And she's, her, her physical vessel is, 
is starting to decline some, and we're doing everything we can to balance everything and the medications and every way we can, but you know, you do everything you can for this human vessel, but Paul's saying our human vessels are frail and, and they're, they're human, they're imperfect, but, but in us is still that faith, that faith that, that we have in our life now and it continues on forever in our lives. And you know, she has that faith, even though physically she's going down, she doesn't complain, she, she expects, you know, whatever's next coming in, in her own life. But they were asking her the other day, you know, are, are you cognizant? Can you understand us? She said, what's your name? And two or three people said, what's your name? What's your name? She said, well, what's your name anyway? She said back to her. <laughs> well, you know, she's still got a sense of humor. She's still got that spirit and that faith in her that sustains her. We have a treasure, Paul says. It's in an earthen ve vessel. It's in the scriptures, but the book is not, not the treasure, it's the message in the book. We have a treasure in our church, and that's the good news of the gospel of Christ that's been passed on to us that we pass on to others. But what are we supposed to do with this treasure? Have us sit in the dinner bowl and, and just sit there and look at it? No, it's, we're called to share this treasure with others. We're called to share this good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the love of Christ with others. And how do we do that? Well, this church is doing it in so many ways already. Uh, we do it by inviting others. If you have a treasure, you want to share it with others, as Mr. Mark was saying. You want to not keep it to yourself, you want to share it with other people. So the good news that we have in this treasure in this church is meant to be shared with those that are here and those who are still coming. So we need to continue to be an inviting church, to continue to invite people into our church. Every opportunity we have to experience this good news and the treasure of Jesus Christ that we have here is a treasure we want to share with the world. And by inviting others to participate and be with us, we're sharing that treasure with others in this earthen vessel that we have together. We also do it by welcoming and showing hospitality to others when they arrive. You know, the thing about the early church was it was a magnetic environment. As we have magnetic environments within our church here that, that welcome people and, and make them feel at home, the early church People gathered around it because they saw how much people loved each other. They saw how much people accepted each other despite their difference of opinions at times. The church was a place where people gathered to experience the love of Jesus Christ, Paul says, as the most important thing, the power that came from God to all of them that they had in common. It was a power that helped them through affliction to not be destroyed, to not be crushed in all the trials they had in the early church. It was a faith that they had in Christ. And we have that faith and that hospitality of welcoming others makes a huge difference. When we see people in the hallways, we can, and they're looking around, we can smile at them and, and offer them our hospitality and ask them if we can help them find something or guide them somewhere. Or better yet, you could join our hospitality team, our blue shirt hospitality team, our connecting card outside, or the many ways we're trying to become the most radical uh, place in the universe here at First Church in terms of our hospitality. You can help us to make this place the friendliest, most welcoming hospitality place in its whole community and beyond. And a third way, besides inviting and welcoming and loving people who come into our midst, is helping them connect. Helping people find a place to serve. We all have that treasure inside of us, but it's expressed in different ways through different gifts that each of us has. And so those gifts as part of that treasure we have are meant to be used for the glory of God and the building up of the kingdom. And so the gifts that each of us have can be used in some way. And so I encourage you to get connected with our church in some way if you haven't. Sammy did it through our hospitality team. She came forward and said, I want to help lead that. She's looking at some other things. She said, I want to get this started. I want to get that started. You know, that's the kind of spirit of, of hospitality that we need with, uh, of all of us and connecting of each of you. We have a wonderful outreach ministry. We have wonderful ministries in the life of this church. But what could we do next within the treasure that's in you and the gifts that you bring to help us even make this a stronger place to, and find a place for you to share the treasures of Christ's love in you with others. It might be something new. We've got a lot of young adults who've been going out on our, our recreational activities together with us to get out and outdoors and enjoy the kind of canoeing and kayaking and things outside together, things that bond us together. New creative kind of things we can do that we aren't even doing yet that you might, God might speak on your, to your heart to start anew. Well, a seminary professor once told me years ago when I, this uh, text first struck me, he said, you know, we're a, we're a, uh, we have a treasure in earthen vessel, he said. 
And when you go out to help lead in the church, he said, remember, you have that treasure of the good news of Christ to share with others. And he said, it's an earthen vessel. The church is not perfect. It's made up of human beings. It's not a perfect church. You'll never find a perfect church. But it's a place where the good news dwells. And you have to keep focusing on the good news. And I'm proud of the United Methodist Church. And I'm proud to be part of this church because this is a church that cares about reaching out to other people in so many ways, through the Cowtown, through the mission, to our justice ministry, outreach, all the other ways that we reach out to others. And when disasters strike and people lose things and they need their faith sustained, it's the church that's often there and the United Methodist Church that's usually there first as well. You know, for a, a while I chaired the Disaster Response Committee in our conference and we had a shirt that we wore that said, when the earth rocks, uh, UMCOR, the United Methodist Church rolls. So we're rock and rollers, okay? And when, it, when, it, when the earth uh, rocks, uh, the United Methodist Church rolls. And I was thinking about that in the contrast recently to one of the self-proclaimed prophets that came forth and declared that the earth was going to end on a certain day recently and that Christ was returning on a certain date he determined in his Bible and that everyone should sell a lot of their possessions and send them in, of course, not to give them away to others, but send them in to him so that he could, he could keep track of them for them uh, instead of distributing them to others. I mean, if I thought the world was going to end, I wouldn't keep everything. I'd start giving things away a little bit more, you know, if it was, if it was ending. But he got millions of dollars that came into him. And of course, like back in the 1800s and other times, the calculation was off the date a year or so. So please wait for another year and he'll be back then. Happens over and over again, my generation, every generation. But that's why I'm proud about the United Methodist Church. When disasters strike, we don't look, sit around looking, is this the second coming or not? Christ said we'll never know. But he said, get out there and serve others, feed others, care for others. When disasters strike, affirm people's faith. The thing we have as this treasure and earthen vessel is our faith. It's something that outlasts our earthen vessel. It will be in the future church in generations to come. It will be that treasure that lasts. The treasure that's in your life that sustains you, the treasure that's in mine, the treasure in this, life, in this church, the treasure of the kingdom that's still alive that Christ is bringing to our world today. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the treasures of life you give us. And we need to stop and be grateful for them in so many ways, for family and relationships, for food and shelter, for the basics of life every day. But we thank you for the treasure of our faith, the treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ for him in our lives, working within us, loving us, empowering us, and calling us to find new ways to serve you and be faithful to you in all that we do and become. Amen. Thank you.